The story of Yellowstone wolves is both inspiring in the end and um, a story of caution. If you mess with an ecological balance, it will be very difficult to bring it back to where it was. So as the ecologists were trying to make the argument for reintroducing wolves into the ecosystem, there were certain questions they had to consider. Um, the biggest one of which really was how many wolves to bring back. And that is based on a number of other factors that were at the time in play in the ecosystem. So let's think a little bit about what questions that they have to consider in general. Um, they had to think about, are there any other prey or are there any other predator? What is the reproduction, um, the reproduction um, habits and what are the reproduction numbers of the prey? Because while the wolves had to suppress um, the elk, they also couldn't or shouldn't um, go hungry and they should also not eradicate or uh, kill off all of the prey at the same time. Um, because we are going to be modeling this mathematically, the situation is very difficult um, and very complex to model. We will have to make some simplifying assumptions. Just like in the case when we modeled for cells, we made an assumption the cell was um, spherical in order to be able to draw any conclusions. Here, we will have to also make some of those simplifying assumptions and as before, our conclusions are only going to be as good as our assumptions. Uh, we're going to have to think of what type of predators are wolves, and this is something you guys are going to talk about in class, um, and how we generally can model the elk population, right? We have two factors, wolves and elk, and we have to know something about each one of them in order to put it together into one complex model. So let's think about the predation rate. Um, generally, um, we have that, let me just write down some data that we have available from field studies and that we know that are in the habits of um, wolves and elks. So generally, a wolf will eat about two elk or will need about two elk uh, per wolf per month. Now, in the Yellowstone Park or in any other park, um, that's a multi-predator system, right? And so while some of the other smaller predators like coyotes will not necessarily hunt um, elk, they will feed on whatever wolves have hunted and left behind. So while the per wolf you need approximately two elk a month, some of that will get lost to other factors. So let's say that we will be assuming that on average we will need 30 elk per wolf per year. Okay, so from the two, it really should be 24, but we're accounting for some amount of prey getting lost to other scavenger um, hunters. Okay, so we will need approximately 30 elk per wolf per year. Now, what does that mean in terms of our modeling? I would like to come up with an actual function to describe this. As you will discuss in class, there are three main types of predators and Wolves fall under the third type, so they are actually well described, their predation rate is well described by a cubic um, hill function. If the hill function has to plateau out at 30, that's its horizontal asymptote. Thinking back to um, how that is put together in the function itself, um, let's just say we have this predation rate, we will call this function p of x. We will have something x cubed over something plus x cubed, right? And if we would like that to plateau at 30, I encourage you to pause the video here and think for a second about what can you fill in, if anything, out of these two numbers to guarantee yourself the plateau level at 30. Okay, pause right now. So thinking about this, we need the horizontal asymptote to be 30. If we have this coefficient as 1, then 30 has to appear on top here. This second number um, on the bottom here actually describes the dynamics near the origin for small, um, for small density of prey. Um, and the number I'm going to give you here has actually been derived again from field studies. Um, so this is something that we just had to make sure it fits the actual available data um, and not the wolf behavior um, just from very general factors, right? So this number is fairly large, 22 power 3 is what makes this model fit really well with the data that we have available. That's on the wolf side. On the prey or 
elk side, what we have to account for is how fast they reproduce because it is their reproduction rate also that has to be somehow um, limited by the wolf predation rate. If the predator starts um, killing off too much prey, more than are actually being reproduced, then the prey eventually will also um, get killed off, which is not the situation we want to find ourselves in. So for the prey production rate, we know that every female will produce approximately, every female over one year old will produce approximately one calf a year. So approximately one calf per year per female. Now, um, some, the female has to be at least one year old. Now, sometimes they will have two calves, but very rarely. And the other piece of information that is useful here to know is that approximately 70% of the herd is female. So if we say approximately 70% of the herd is female and the female has to be at least one year old to actually reproduce and they produce approximately one calf per year, let's say that some don't make it through to adulthood, we can approximate this sort of birth rate of the prey to be, let's say, in terms of how many um, elk there are, to be, let's say, 0.5x. So this is a slight underestimation here, right? Because I'm saying 70% of the herd is female, um, but not all of them are over one year old. So let's say 65% or 60 or 55% of them are over one year old, and then they will produce about a half, uh, one calf each that will be um, alive or like will actually survive um, to then be eaten by wolves. Okay, now, um, as I've mentioned uh, earlier, I think some of this data comes from field studies, but also this, for example, is a rough. Uh, approximation, right? So I'm not here um, to produce exact numbers because the situation itself is much more complex than we're able to model at this point, but to just give us some idea of what goes into some of these modeling considerations. So for prey density, we have that the contributing factor to the prey is the, reprodu the reproduction factor and the predation actually takes some of the prey away, right? So for the function that we're interested in is, let's say, the predation rate minus the birth rate. You can also consider the function the other way around, and you'll just have to adjust what, you, um, what you're on the lookout for, um, for in that case. Right? And so then we have to think about it, uh, two questions to consider. For what prey density is prey most in danger, and for what prey density is predator most in danger? So in terms of the function f of x, I encourage you to actually, I'm not going to answer these questions here, I encourage you to really think about what these things, what do you need to know about the function f of x to really answer these questions. But because we have specific formulas for both of these, let's take a quick look at what the graphs of those functions look like. So this is my predation rate function, a nice cubic hill function, just looking at the graph, you can see the cubic snaky uh, behavior near the origin and then the plateau to 30 um, at, for the large values of x. And let's say this is my birth, predation, uh, birth reproduction, prey reproduction rate, uh, which is 0.5x as we've determined. Now, these two functions actually intersect um, at three points, at zero, if there's no prey and there's no predator, nothing is going on. The, in the ecosystem and then there were two other points where they actually intersect so we could look at the function that describes their differences but sometimes it's actually easier to look at the two separate functions involved so notice that they intersect somewhere around like 13 or something and then somewhere else later um, around you know 57 or 58 those two points actually will represent some kind of ecological balance where the predation rate and the Prey, prey reproduction are exactly equal. So the number of elk being produced are also the number of elk being killed off and therefore the population somehow stabilizes. So when you are an ecologist and you're trying to introduce wolves back into the system, looking for ecological balance means you're actually looking for intersection points on this graph. And unsurprisingly, although our model has been simplified from the reality, our numbers should be somewhat close, right? And so 
later on we will figure out which one of these intersection points um, is a little more dangerous in terms of introducing um, you know that many wolves or that few wolves but ecologists did discover that 12 wolves is actually the number of wolves that they needed to introduce in order to maintain eco balance into the system and prevent elk from taking everything over um, so this i think is pretty amazing because with very few tools and just basic information available about the wolves and the elk we were able to produce a graph that gives us a fairly close answer to what the ecologists discovered they needed to do to save Yellowstone Park. And once again, this is the real strength of mathematics is that we can adapt concepts from one area of study such as enzyme kinetics to another area of study such as predator-prey dynamics. It's the same types of functions, hill functions that describe both. So one type of mathematical analysis will allow us to draw conclusions into very different types of contexts and that's very fascinating. Make sure you check for uh, pre-lecture homework on web work and web work homework um, for this week.